the floor littered with collapsed roof timbers. Its roof totally destroyed. Charred timbers testimony to how the fire was able to take hold and spread so quickly. On the night of the 20th of November, 1992, flames engulfed the ancient royal palace fortress of Windsor Castle. As they rose, Queen Elizabeth II, in Wellingtons and waterproofs, glumly surveyed the wreckage of her favourite home. But Windsor was more than her home. It was her name. Elizabeth's grandfather, King George V, had changed his name from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor to rebrand the royal family. And the rebranding had worked. The House of Windsor had survived and thrived through almost a century of unprecedented change. But now, its good name also was being consumed by a firestorm of scandal as the heir to the throne and his wife paraded their mutual adultery in the public prints in an unedifying royal family feud. Was the House of Windsor about to collapse along with the building which had given it its name? This programme, the last for the time being at least in my monarchy series, describes the rise, triumph and eventual humiliation of the House of Windsor, and it tries to do so in the measured voice of the historian. It lists unsparingly the crises and the scandals, but it also asks what the nation has gained as well as lost from the continuation of monarchy. And it looks to the future, if indeed there is to be one. Will this thousand-year-old institution reinvent itself once more? Or will the glory of monarchy finally fade away, having bored us and itself to death? Queen Victoria's funeral took place in 1901. At almost 82, she was the longest lived of any English sovereign and, with over 63 years on the throne, the longest reigning also. Her last words were, Bertie. Bertie, that is her son, Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, was in his 60th year, browbeaten by his father, Prince Albert, and sidelined by his mother. He had become a prince of pleasure. But dissipation had been oddly good for him. Unimpressive as a young man, age had given him girth, gravitas, and a confident manner. In short, he now appeared and sounded every inch a king. He even looked a bit like Henry VIII. And, like Henry VIII, he was determined that his reign should mark a fresh start. 24 hours after his mother's death, Bertie was making his accession speech here at St James's Palace in London. And it contained a bombshell. He would be known, he declared, as King Edward VII, not as Albert I, as his mother had devoutly wished. For I wish, the new king declared, that Albert's name should stand alone. Victoria's long reign, which Albert had done so much to shape, was well and truly over. And this was only the start of the new king's comprehensive rejection of his parents and their past. He got rid of Osborne by giving it to the nation. He purged Windsor and Buckingham Palace of 60 years' accumulation of clutter and mementos, and he redecorated Buckingham Palace in the smart new white, gold and crimson style of the Edwardian Grand Hotels. For Edward had a taste for ceremonial. He even used the National Memorial to Victoria as a pretext to redesign the Marl as the setting for grand state ceremonies. Victoria, alive, had detested royal pomp and circumstance. Even for her golden jubilee of 1887, she'd refused to wear a crown. 
Edward had no such inhibitions. There would be no Republican simplicity in his reign. He immediately decided to revive the state opening of Parliament, which Victoria had first truncated and then abandoned in its full, colourful ritual. So, on the 14th of February, only three weeks after the Queen's death, he processed to the gilded splendours of the House of Lords here in his crimson, gold and ermine robes and read the speech himself. He even proposed changes to its contents until he was firmly slapped down by the Prime Minister. It was the same with the coronation, which he proposed to restore to all its ancient splendour. was decided to crown him with the massive St Edward's crown, which had last been used for the coronation of William and Mary in 1689. In fact, sudden illness prevented Edward from wearing it, but the historical associations of the crown were so appealing to the popular imagination that the illustrated London News coronation number showed Edward wearing the St Edward's crown anyway. What was Edward doing? Some historians have seen Edward and his advisers as consciously inventing spectacular ceremony to appeal to the new mass electorate created by the late 19th century Reform Acts. Perhaps there was an element of this, but essentially Edward preened and paraded because he wanted to, not to make the monarchy more democratic. He got away with it because the times were right. Land of hope and glory. Edward Elgar's rousing melody caught the mood of national confidence of Britain at the turn of the 19th century. But how would Edward's monarchy of pomp and circumstance fare in the coming century of the common man and people power? Edward VII, the playboy who became king, had transformed the monarchy. He'd introduced the showmanship and ceremonial that his mother, Victoria, had detested. The celebrations of his coronation in 1902 had also coincided with national rejoicing for the victorious outcome of the Boer War. But the celebrations were also tinged with relief. At times, Britain had seemed to be heading for defeat in South Africa. The war, with the near-universal foreign sympathy for the Afrikaners, had also highlighted Britain's isolation in Europe. This gave Edward an opportunity to intervene in foreign policy. In contrast to Victoria's devotion to the empire, Edward's real interest lay in continental Europe, where he had spent spring and autumn each year as Prince of Wales. Now, on his own initiative, he undertook a state visit to Paris in May 1903. At first, the French gave him a cool reception. But his gallantry and his excellent French turned the visit into a triumph. And the following year, the Treaty of Cooperation, known as the Entente Cordiale, was signed. For better and for worse, Britain was involved in the alliances of continental Europe once more. It was a shift in foreign policy which would eventually drag Britain into the First World War. Arguably, her involvement saved democracy in Europe. But it did so at the cost of precipitating the worst crisis in the history of the British monarchy for over 200 years. Only Edward was not there to see it. On the 6th of May, 1910, his bull-like constitution finally broke. After smoking his last cigar and taking a light luncheon, he collapsed and was helped to a chair. At five o'clock, he was told that his horse had won at Kempton Park. I am very glad, he replied. They were his last coherent words, and he died at about a quarter to midnight. An hour or two after his father's death, the new king, George V, wrote in his diary, 
I have lost my best friend and the best of fathers. I never had a word with him in his life. I am heartbroken and overwhelmed with grief. For the first time in the two centuries of the House of Hanover, a father had been succeeded by a son who loved and respected him. George was the opposite of his father in almost everything. He was slim, abstemious and rather shy. He was devoted to his wife, his weather gauge and his stamp collection. Above all, he was driven by a strong sense of duty. His first actions were devoted to his father. He invented a new royal ritual to commemorate him. The old king would lie in state in Westminster Hall. It was Edward VII's last and most successful public appearance. Half a million people filed past his coffin in what the illustrated London news called the people's lying in state. George, however, who'd nothing of the celebrity in his temperament and loathed the very concept, was far less relaxed about the ceremonies in which, of necessity, he as king was the star. The most terrible ordeal I have ever gone through. George confided to his diary of his first state opening of Parliament. But his sense of duty meant that he not only persevered, he even went beyond his father with his natural appetite for ceremony. Edward had only worn the cocked hat of a field marshal at the annual state opening of Parliament. But from 1913, George decided that people wanted him to wear the imperial state crown. Now augmented with the massive Cullinan II diamond, a peace offering from the South African government following the Boer War. The crown was subject to repeated alterations, but it was never successfully fitted to his narrow skull. And as he got older, it gave him dreadful headaches. All the same, he continued with his self-imposed burden of wearing it at the annual state opening. This is the measure of the difference between George V and his father. George persevered with ceremonies, not because he liked them, he didn't, but because he thought it was the right thing to do. This is ceremony as the monarch's hair shirt and straight jacket, undertaken not through inclination, but as a solemn duty. And it was this sense of duty which would transform the monarchy once more as it faced the prospect of ever more rapid and more radical social change at home and abroad. The seeds of the crisis were sown in 1906, where the Liberals had won a crushing general election victory on a platform of state welfare benefits and social reform. But the Tory-dominated House of Lords blocked reform at every point. Now the Liberal government decided to force through a radical measure known as the Parliament Act to curtail permanently the power of the Lords. George found himself drawn into the conflict when the Liberal government determined to get his agreement that, should the Lords continue to resist, he would agree to make hundreds of new Liberal peers to swamp, once and for all, the Tory opposition. The king was instinctively hostile, but he found himself the object of fierce pressure. The confrontation took place here at Buckingham Palace. The Liberal Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, browbeat the inexperienced king mercilessly. He was also double-crossed by his private secretary, who concealed the fact that the Tories were willing to form an alternative government. George never forgave those who'd taken advantage of him but probably it was for the best. The powers of the Lords were indefensible. The important thing from the King's point of view was to stop the monarchy going down with the peerage. In spite of himself, George had distanced the monarchy from the aristocracy. The move was a necessary condition for the survival of the monarchy in a democracy. It also freed the monarchy to find other allies. Soon, George confronted a far more immediate threat, 
when the system of continental alliances, which Britain had rejoined under Edward VII, sucked Britain and the Empire into the slaughter of the First World War. The royal family did its bit. The king visited the troops in the field, Queen Mary cheered up the wounded in hospital, and the Prince of Wales joined up, though fear of his capture meant that, to his intense frustration, he was never allowed near the front. Nineteen seventeen was the worst year yet. In England, the strain of war led to strikes, mutinies and political radicalisation. In Russia, similar pressures triggered the revolution. The Tsarist monarchy was overthrown and the Tsar and his family taken into custody. Nicholas II was George's ally, cousin and personal friend. They even looked alike. Now, he and his wife and children were in mortal danger. But for George to offer him safe haven risked stoking the fires of social protest in Britain. It might even risk his own crown and family. George's reaction was bold and brutal. He left Nicholas and his family to their deaths by refusing them refuge in Britain. Then, he and his advisers embarked on a series of radical measures to shed old baggage and make new friends. First, he signalled a clear break with the past, and in particular, the German past, by changing his family name to Windsor. This was a masterpiece of spin. Windsor. It distanced the royal family from their embarrassingly close connections with the enemy Hun and repackaged them as pure English. Windsor, the name selected after careful consideration, is redolent of all things English. Shakespeare, pageantry, sweet old-fashioned smells. But it was more than renaming. George went on to try to make the royal family English in blood by decreeing that now his children could marry English men and women rather than the German spouses which had been customary hitherto. This was an historic day, he wrote in his diary. It was. A German dynasty had become an English family, perhaps even the representative Great British family. The monarchy had long since ceased to rule the nation. Now, instead, could it symbolise the nation and its most precious values of hearth and home? George's blameless personal life meant that the role of patriarch of the national family fitted him like a glove and much more comfortably than his crown. But it wasn't only a question of making the monarchy English. George also realised that England had changed and that the monarchy must change with it. He sought to ally the renewed Windsor monarchy to the new social forces that had emerged during the Great War and just before, like women, socialism and the enormous expansion of both the civil and the armed services. His key tool was a renewed honour system. Its centrepiece was the new order of the British Empire. This had a membership of thousands and reached the places that the old honours did not, women, trade unionists and labour mayors. But above all, the new honours were given for services to those who did that bit more in their jobs and in voluntary work in their local communities. 1917 had created a new monarchy. The renaming had turned a scandal-ridden German dynasty into a model English family. The new honour system put the monarchy firmly on the side of the workers and of the angels. It was committed to the ethos of public service, of which it saw itself as the apex and exemplar. It wasn't socialist, far from it but it did believe that there was such a thing as society, which is why, from that day to this, it has tended to be more comfortable with Labour and wet Tory governments rather than high-and-dry Thatcherite ones. The monarchy had become 
a moral one. And it was morality in its vulgar sense of sexual behaviour that was to carry it to its peak and its depths. The early 20th century monarchy had been prepared to do almost anything to survive. Edward VII had restored popular royal ceremonies whose pomp and circumstance chimed in with the British view of themselves. George V had distanced the monarchy from the aristocracy and brought it closer to labour and the voluntary sector with the new honour system. Most important of all, George created the idea of the Windsors as a national family role model. But the establishment of a family monarchy also depended on the next generation. Here, the prospects were mixed. George V had two older sons, David Edward, Prince of Wales and heir to the throne, and Albert George, Duke of York. They turned out to be very different in character. David Edward took after his grandparents. He inherited Queen Alexandra's blonde, blue-eyed good looks and King Edward's temperament. He was intelligent, curious, a good linguist and a natural charmer. But he was also contrary, found it difficult to concentrate and reverted to the Hanoverian norm by getting on badly with his father. Albert George, on the other hand, was a slower, dimmer version of his father. He passed 68th out of 69 in his final school examination, was not need and cursed with a dreadful stammer. On the other hand, he had application, stamina, and at the age of 17 became a convinced Christian. The two brothers, in short, were the hare and the tortoise. Not least in the matter of love, David Edward was very popular with women and had a succession of mistresses from an early age, but there was no sign of a wife. Albert George, on the other hand, was more inclined to matrimony. In 1920, he encountered Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. But Elizabeth was in no hurry, and Albert George, inexperienced and justifiably afraid of rejection, hesitated. Not till 1922, and at what was rumoured to be the third attempt, was his proposal accepted. Elizabeth, daughter of an earl and cousin of a duke, was exactly the kind of British spouse that George had envisaged for his children when he changed the royal marriage rules in 1917. The marriage was socially acceptable. It was also rooted in romantic love, as the post-war popular mood demanded. It also demanded that the wedding be turned into a public spectacle. It took place at Westminster Abbey on the 26th of April, 1923. The sermon was preached by Cosmo Gordon Lang, Archbishop of York. Lang played a key part in the development of the 20th century family monarchy. Despite his own, probably non-practicing, homosexuality, Lang led the opposition to the reform of the divorce laws in the name of the defense of Christian marriage. With his marriage sermon, he enlisted the family monarchy as a powerful ally in his campaign. George had already turned the monarchy into a monarchy of duty. Now Lang added a fresh responsibility to the already overburdened royal shoulders to have, or at least to appear to have, a perfect marriage. You cannot resolve that your marriage shall be happy his sermon warned the couple in a solemn admonition. You can and shall resolve that it shall be noble. Or, in less elevated language, you'll stick together, come what may, and never, ever divorce. As it happened, the Yorks were happy. At least he was. 
His marriage transformed him and was the turning point of his life. A daughter, Elizabeth, was born in 1926, and another, Margaret Rose, four years later. The result was an idyllic family life. Despite the trappings of wealth and royalty, the press contrived to present the family as normal, even suburban. But Albert George was only the second son. Meanwhile, the eldest, David Edward, carried out a series of spectacularly successful tours of the empire. He glad-handed, defied protocol and flaunted his sex appeal. The crowds went wild and he became the first royal star of the new mass media. He was a celebrity and a royal rebel. Celebrity was one way forward for a modern monarchy, but it faced the tremendous obstacle of the family monarchy as established and embodied by George V and elaborated by Archbishop Lang. Lang saw himself as the high priest of a cult of which monarchy was the earthly deity. The result was a kind of English Shinto, like the Japanese, the English were to worship their king emperor and his family as the embodiment of the nation. And by and large, Lang achieved his aim. When George met the Dominion Prime Ministers, the British Prime Minister felt that we had taken part in something very much like Holy Communion. Monarchy was no longer simply in alliance with religion. It had become a religion. It had also become a substitute, at once saner, calmer and more decent for the virulent nationalisms of continental Europe. This meant that no British Mussolini or Hitler could pose as the embodiment of the nation. That role was already taken. In Britain, at least, patriotism and politics would be kept at arm's length. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I am enabled this day... A bigger and more resonant pulpit, even than Archbishop Lang's, was to hand. Radio. The British Broadcasting Corporation, whose council chamber this is, was less than ten years old. It had been established in 1927 by Royal Charter and given a monopoly of the new medium of radio. Its first director general was John Reith. Like his friend, Archbishop Lang, Reith was an ambitious, driven, sexually ambiguous Scot who was determined to use the BBC to inculcate a morally cohesive society. And, like Lang, he saw the monarchy as a crucial ally in his campaign. The result was an alliance between the corporation and the monarchy that was almost as close and important as that between the Crown and the Church of England. My life's aim has been to serve. Your loyalty, your confidence in me has been my abundant reward. George had a flair for radio, and the medium's capacity to reach out directly to the listener made it easy for him to take on the role of national father. I speak now from my home and from my heart to you all. George made the first of what will become the annual Christmas broadcast from Sandringham on the 25th of December, 1932. He also broadcast again three years later on the occasion of the Silver Jubilee. I am speaking to the children above all. Remember, children, the king is speaking to you. On the 20th of January, 1936, George V died at Sandringham. In previous centuries, heralds would have proclaimed the death of kings. Now, radio would announce the death of the nation's father to Britain and the empire. At just gone midnight, the final bulletin was read by Wreath himself. Death came peacefully to the king at 11.55 p.m. 
David Edward, Playboy, Globetrotter and Womanizer now succeeded as King Edward VIII. He began with a flurry of activity. He wanted substantial cuts in the coronation service. He made slashing reductions in the running costs and staffing at Sandringham and Balmoral. He walked in the street and he said, most famously, something must be done about the unemployed. But all this was more an attitude than a serious programme of modernisation. Edward was serious about one thing, however, Wallace Simpson. Wallace Simpson, born in 1896 and the impoverished descendant of two distinguished families of the American South, was a classic woman on the make, hard-edged, firm-jawed, acquisitive and with a certain brittle style. You can never be too rich or too thin, she's supposed to have said. She was also the most disruptive force of the 20th century British monarchy before the advent of Princess Diana. David Edward had first met Wallace in 1931 and had quickly decided that, since to him she was the perfect woman, she was his natural sexual and intellectual partner for life. But there were obstacles. She was American, divorced and presently remarried to an American businessman. It would have been difficult to think of anyone further from an ideal queen for the family monarchy. Edward was used to getting his own way. As Prince of Wales, he'd done it by breaking the rules. Now, as king, he would have to change the rules or face the consequences. Henry VIII had broken with the Church of Rome to marry Anne Boleyn. To marry Wallace Simpson, Edward would have to break Lang's Church of England and Reith's BBC. Instead, he did nothing. He merely waited, hoping for something to turn up. The establishment, led by Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, also played a waiting game. Meanwhile, Lang, Reith and their ally, the editor of The Times, waited ready to pounce and destroy Edward as unworthy to occupy the throne of the family monarchy. It was no contest. Self-censorship by the press kept the British public in the dark about the affair till it was almost a fait accompli. On the 16th of November, Edward saw Prime Minister Baldwin and the royal family and told them of his determination to marry Wallace and, if need be, abdicate in order to do so. Edward made a final plea to be allowed to put his case directly to the people in a broadcast. This too was rejected and cornered. On the 11th of December, the king signed irrevocably the act of abdication. Only then, and still with some trepidation, was he allowed to seize the microphone and speak directly to the nation. At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. It may be some time before I return to my native land I wish you happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. 
The broadcast had shown Edward at his brilliant, media-savvy best, with all the qualities that, in different circumstances, might have made of him the perfect modernising king. But by then, it was too late. The tortoise had beaten the hare. Edward had paid the price for offending the ideal of the family monarchy, and the conscientious second-rate Albert George was king. With the most solemn and sacred pictures ever taken by a newsreel, we show you, inside the abbey, the supreme moment when King George is crowned. Albert George chose the same royal name as his father, and his signature is practically indistinguishable from his. He reverted to the same old-fashioned circle of friends and courtiers, like Archbishop Lang, and he shared the same obsession with dress and uniform, with his only recorded innovation being the invention of specially pinched-in dress trousers to allow for the wearing of the garter below the left knee. They did not catch on. Above all, with his close-knit family, whom he referred to as We Four, George VI exemplified the family values which had been so flagrantly defied by Edward VIII. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. In one area, however, there was less break with the immediate past. George VI was not as ostentatiously pro-German as Edward VIII had been, but he was a passionate supporter of appeasement, and when Neville Chamberlain returned from Munich with Peace in Our Time, he was paraded with the King and Queen on the balcony of Buckingham Palace in front of huge cheering crowds. It was an act of gross political partisanship worthy of Victoria at her most unconstrained. But war came anyway, and the family monarchy found a role for itself amidst the bombed-out ruins of London. The royal family represented the sufferings of the British people on the home front. They remained in London, though spending most nights in the comparative safety of Windsor. Their food and clothes were rationed, and George, who was frugal at the best of times, personally marked the five-inch maximum line on the baths in Buckingham Palace. And they took a direct hit when a daring daytime raid dropped a cluster of bombs on the palace, narrowly missing the king himself. Now we can look the East End in the face, said Queen Elizabeth, who had been indefatigable in visiting bomb sites and comforting the survivors. But the role of war leader, symbolic as well as real, fell on Churchill. George was temperamentally unsuited to the task, but, understandably, he came to view Churchill's prominence as a national icon with something like jealousy. Things came to a head when Churchill, with characteristic bravado, announced his determination to go in after the first wave of troops in the D-Day landings. Determined not to be outdone, the king scotched the scheme by threatening to accompany him. In the event, once secure beachheads had been established, they visited Normandy, but separately. All was forgiven, however, in victory, and on VE Day, the 8th of May, 1945, Churchill joined the King on the balcony of Buckingham Palace to celebrate the end of the war in Europe. Two months later, Churchill was crushingly defeated in a general election. The king now had to deal with a very different prime minister, Clement Attlee. In fact, they turned out to have much in common. Both were unassuming, hardworking, ascetic, and wedded to an unbending view of duty and public service. 
Once again, socialism and the House of Windsor proved not unhappy bedfellows. But this was possible only because the monarchy, whilst retaining its prestige and moral authority, had long lost all political power. Indeed, this loss of power has proved to be the foundation of the success of the House of Windsor. In most of Europe, monarchy was the obstacle to democracy and was swept away by it. Here, the House of Windsor was established at the same time as democracy and, from the beginning, its values were the popular ones of family, hearth and home. They may have been a bit narrow and dull, but they did help to preserve the decencies of life through the Depression, total war and social revolution, and that is not a small achievement. When George VI died prematurely at the age of 57 in 1952, he left behind him a monarchy that was stable and surprisingly unscathed. He also left it to a daughter who was determined to keep it that way. The future Queen Elizabeth II seems to have been aware of her position from an extraordinarily young age. She gave the Windsor wave in her perambulator and behaved as a miniature royal, even as a child. In contrast, her education at the hands of devoted governesses was modest and undemanding. Outside experts were brought in only in history, French and, most successfully, in riding, which, along with dogs, became a lifelong passion. Books, on the other hand, remained alien. Reading was for state papers. Surrounded by doting parents and servants, it was a happy and secure upbringing. Indeed, for a preternaturally conformist, orderly little girl, it was perhaps a bit too secure. It would be hard to think of a greater contrast with the childhood of Elizabeth's distant cousin, Prince Philip of Greece. They met in 1939, when Elizabeth was on a royal visit to Dartmouth Naval College, where Philip was then a cadet. He showed off, she fell and remained deeply in love. Philip had been born on a kitchen table and was homeless at nine when his parents split up. Thereafter, he'd lived the life of an adventurer with only his wits and his royal connections to depend on. There was opposition, especially from the stuffier courtiers, but Elizabeth, as usual, got her way and they were married in 1947. It was, and perhaps remains, a marriage of opposites. Just over four years later, on the 6th of February 1952, whilst in Africa on the first leg of an imperial tour, she received the news of the death of her father and returned to England as Queen. On the flight back, the new Queen got up once or twice to relieve her feelings in private. But there was none of her father's nervous anxiety about an unlooked-for and unwelcome burden still less of her uncle's chippy resentment. Instead, there was a calm acceptance, part religious, part robust common sense of the job she'd been born to do, to be not just a queen, but a Windsor queen. And it was the rituals and values of the House of Windsor that were unrolled once more. Elizabeth's coronation took over a year to organise. Meanwhile, there was great emphasis on the Windsor family. Her mother, it was announced, would take the title of Queen Mother, which George V had invented for his own mother, while the title of the royal house would continue to be Windsor. This latter met with opposition from her husband Philip, who felt that his wife should take his own name of Mountbatten. To soothe his feelings, she made him chairman of the committee to plan the coronation. 
he was eager for some features relevant to the world today to be introduced. But his was a lone voice on a committee whose collective memory stretched back more than 50 years. The result was that the coronation of 1953 was a polished replay of the historicist pageantry of the earlier Windsor coronations. But there was one hugely important innovation nonetheless. For a new mass medium had appeared alongside radio and cinema. To the right, the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk attended all by their pages, and then followed by St. Edward's crown, borne by the Lord High Steward, Admiral of the Fleet, the Viscount coming along. Should TV be permitted to broadcast the crowning of Elizabeth II? The Queen was firmly opposed, but a tide of popular feeling, quickly reflected in the press, forced a retreat at the palace. The result was that on the 2nd of June, 1953, I, then an eight-year-old boy in my Sunday best, gathered along with countless millions of others to watch the coronation on a neighbour's television set, which had been bought specially for the occasion. It was the first time that I'd seen television or a monarch, and I've never forgotten it. Elizabeth's fear had been that television would trivialise or vulgarise the ceremony. She needn't have worried. Instead, the mellifluous, silken-tongued Richard Dimbleby delivered a commentary whose stately language complemented and occasionally outdid the text of the service itself. We see in the distance the front rank of the peeresses who sit, their tiaras a glitter and a shimmer, in their rows and rows, piece by piece, the regalia are placed upon the altar, being handed to the Archbishop and by him to the Dean of Westminster. Admiral Lord Cum the alliance between the Crown and the BBC, first established under George V, was as strong as ever under his granddaughter. At least it was to begin with. The coronation of 1953 was the apotheosis of the House of Windsor. The ceremony was perfect. The empire still seemed more or less intact. The queen, with her youth and sincerity, was the most attractive embodiment yet of the Windsor values of family, service and duty, and television against all the odds had proved itself to be the most effective means for their dissemination. Elizabeth, it seemed, had been right to stick with the tried and tested formula of George V and George VI, and Philip's instinct to modernise had been wrong. Or had it? For three decades, Elizabeth sailed serenely on, following the royal script written by her parents and grandparents. In the spring, there was the Royal Maundy service. In summer, there was her official birthday and the trooping of the colour. In autumn, the state opening of Parliament. Each individual event was invested with a broader symbolic meaning and choreographed to within an inch of its life. The cycle culminated each year with the secular sermon of the Christmas broadcast. But smoothly, though the royal machine turns, and has done ever since the coronation, it's filled with paradoxes. It seems immemorial. Yet none of these ceremonies, in their present form at least, is any older than the 20th century. They matter profoundly to the Queen, who devoted most of her 1996 Christmas broadcast to a consideration of their significance to her. Yet, as the increasingly wide-eyed TV commentaries suggest, for the vast majority of her subjects, they've become opaque, even meaningless. 
even in her own family, the next generation has been unwilling or unable to keep to the Queen's iron code of duty. Prince Charles, as a boy, was shy, physically awkward and intense. But he was sent to the notoriously Spartan Gordonston at Prince Philip's insistence. It proved a torment. Charles was happier at Trinity College, Cambridge, from which he graduated with a respectable degree. He spent a year at Aberystwyth to acquire some Welsh, and he was invested as Prince of Wales at Carnarfon Castle in a curiously confected ceremony that, for the first and last time, was devised specifically for television. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb. Charles's search for a suitable wife to continue the ideal of a family monarchy was protracted, and it wasn't until the 29th of July, 1981, that Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer were married at St Paul's Cathedral. It was almost 500 years since the Prince of Wales had been married in St Paul's Cathedral, when Prince Arthur married Catherine of Aragon. That wedding was to lead to the Reformation and two centuries of political turmoil and civil war. Its modern successor started a chain of events which shook, or seemed to shake, the House of Windsor to its foundation. It was, said the Archbishop of Canterbury in his sermon, a fairy tale wedding. And perhaps at the time, that is what Diana believed. Charles's emotions were certainly more ambivalent. He had blown hot and cold on the engagement. Finally, Philip has put his foot down. Charles had gone too far and was honor bound to marry, he said. The result was that the fairy tale ended quickly. There had been difficulties from the start, as Diana, young, highly strung and chaotically brought up, found it hard to fit into the rigid customs of the royal family. She had her suspicions, almost certainly unfounded at this stage, that Charles was continuing his affair with his old flame, Camilla Parker Bowles. The birth of two boys, Prince William in 1982, and Harry, two years later, instead of bringing the couple together, seemed to have exacerbated the problems with their relationship, and, from about 1987, they began to appear together less and less. The press, still besotted like much of the public, with the fairy tale of Cinderella, who'd found her prince and lived happily ever after, showed no inclination to probe. Instead, it was the couple themselves who went public with their rival versions of the failure of their marriage, first in books and then endlessly on TV. The couple now led separate lives. Charles returned to Camilla in good and earnest, whilst Diana began a series of short, tempestuous affairs with all and sundry. The medium that had given Diana her power base by publicising and popularising her every move was now used by her to dismantle the edifice of the family monarchy. Appalled at the damage which the affair was doing, not only to the couple, but to the monarchy itself, the Queen, in one of her rare interventions in family affairs, effectively required them to divorce. But by then, it was too late. Not only was the Wales' marriage over, so too was the family monarchy. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain. In our hearts and in our memories, forever. The Diana story, which reached its climax at once tawdry and tragic, with her death in a car crashed by a drunken driver in 1997, 
is also a testimony to the revolution in British values which took place during the Windsor years. Back in 1936, Edward VIII was widely reviled, not least by Archbishop Lang, for putting personal happiness above royal duty. In the 1990s, however, Diana, who, like Edward, was a celebrity, photogenic, a clothes horse and profoundly self-indulgent, was praised to the very skies for doing just that. Duty was fuddy-duddy, happiness a right at whatever the cost. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. In the face of this tide of sentiment, Elizabeth, with her determination to stick to the monarchy of her father and grandfather, with its unshowy values of duty, service and self-restraint, looked increasingly out of touch. The modern world had caught up with her at last. Even Windsor-style ritual no longer seemed to work. Her misfortunes continued. In 2002, her wayward but deeply loved sister Margaret Rose died, followed only six weeks later by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Elizabeth was now the undisputed matriarch of the Windsors. But were they a family with a future? In fact, on this occasion, what saved the Queen was ceremonial with a large dash of vulgar populism. The celebration of the Queen's Golden Jubilee followed closely on the outpouring of sympathy over the Queen Mother's death. Almost imperceptibly, public opinion had shifted. The Jubilee procession in the old-fashioned royal style was popular. Even the press coverage was positive. The Queen, like Victoria, had recovered her popularity in old age. But the future of the monarchy belongs to the Prince of Wales, who, barring an act of God, will be, must be, king. Charles is a very different character from his mother. Less at ease in formal situations. Still awkward when called on to have fun in public. An excellent parent himself, but reverting to Hanoverian type by having fraught relations with his own father. Intellectually curious, well-read and an accomplished public speaker. All of which means that Charles will be a very different kind of monarch from his mother too. Indeed, he's already given us a foretaste of how radical he's likely to be. On the 9th of April 2005, Charles married his long-term mistress and the real love of his life, Camilla Parker Bowles. The Queen was detached, if not actually disapproving, for the marriage broke every rule in the Windsor book. In 1936, the taint of the divorces of his wife-to-be had forced the abdication of a king emperor. In 2005, both parties were divorced and both had been openly adulterous, but they got away with it. Was it a betrayal of the fundamental principles of the family monarchy or a long overdue recognition of changing times and values? The problem was that if the monarchy, or at least the prince, had changed its spots on the remarriage of divorcee, the Church of England hadn't. This meant that the wedding had to be a civil ceremony before a registrar. 
whether this option is really open to members of the royal family is still not entirely certain. Moreover, it had been overlooked that the venue for civil ceremony has to be licensed. And if it's licensed for one couple, it's licensed for all. The thought of turning the state apartments of Windsor Castle into a public wedding parlour led to a hasty relocation of the ceremony here to Windsor Guild Hall. It is the humblest location for a royal wedding since the clandestine marriage in 1464 of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, which led to the fall of the House of York. <laughs> In 2005, there was still a residual resentment of Camilla, whom Diana's die-hard supporters held responsible for the unhappiness of the previous marriage. To head this off, it was announced that Camilla would be known not as Princess of Wales, but as Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall. Nor would she be styled Queen when Charles became King. Instead, she would just be known as Her Royal Highness, the Princess Consort. All this is legal and historical nonsense. If the wife of a king does not automatically become queen, both by law and immemorial custom, then why did George IV have to try to divorce Caroline of Brunswick in order to deprive her of her title of queen? Or why did Edward VIII have to abdicate in order to marry Mrs Simpson? But, nonsense though it might be, this bold, radical innovation is utterly characteristic of a royal house that had thrown over its name, its nationality and its closest relations in 1917, all in the name of survival. If Charles has managed to do all this as Prince of Wales, what will he dare to do? as king. King Charles III, or King George VII. Charles has already teased us about his possible choice of royal name. He has also said that as king, he would like to be defender of faith rather than defender of the faith. One word, but a world of difference. The defender of the faith is, as the monarch has been since Queen Elizabeth I, supreme governor of the Church of England. But the defender of faith would be patron of many competing and conflicting religions. Whatever Charles hopes, he can't be both. Is it now time for the monarchy to throw over the Church of England, just as it earlier and very successfully detached itself from the peerage? After all, the sometime national church, despite the splendours of its architectural inheritance, is now, in fact, weak, divided and fast shrinking into a mere sect. And if religion still has strength in this country, it lies elsewhere in evangelical Christianity and radical Islam, and neither is very promising material for royal ceremony. In these circumstances, will it be possible for Charles to have a coronation at all? Is it even desirable? Might it be better instead to do the unthinkable and follow in the footsteps of Oliver Cromwell and have a civil inauguration. It is not unthinkable. The regalia of crown, orb and scepter could be used, but a new cast of characters and a different form of words would take account of the tumultuous changes of past decades. But will there still be a king to be crowned? Or will the monarchy follow so many other English institutions into oblivion? History suggests that monarchies rarely disappear, save as a result of defeat in war or revolution, and neither seems in prospect in Britain. Instead, the real dangers are indifference and irrelevance. For the settlement of 1917, which established the House of Windsor, is manifestly played out. Finally shorn of executive power, 
the monarchy created by George V was left with two strings to its bow. First, as the family monarchy, it was the head of our morality, the focus of national sentiment and the guardian of the British way of life. Second, as the font of the reformed and modernised honour system, it was the patron and prime mover of public service and the voluntary sector. Now, 90 years later, very little, frankly, is left of either. The family monarchy was wrecked by the Diana affair, whilst for most of the second half of the 20th century, the voluntary sector was in full-scale retreat before the burgeoning welfare state. Health, schools and the arts were given state funding and subject to increasing state control. Punitive tax rates all but destroyed the Victorian tradition of charitable giving. Altruism, which the new honour system of 1917 existed to reward, had been nationalised, just like coal or steel. But at least the welfare state preserved the distinctive not-for-profit ethos of public service. At least it did, till Margaret Thatcher. She was in love with business, the bigger, the better, and tried to impose business values on the public sector. New Labour, with its love affair with markets, PFI, targets and managerialism, has only followed in her footsteps. The result has been to kill off the not-for-profit ethos of public service. Instead, in our world, business values and the cash nexus rule all. Nevertheless, it remains as true as it always was that human beings are not only motivated by money. They may even, as with increasing numbers of our new rich, want to give it away in prodigious quantities. But if the government and civil service won't recognise this, who will? And who will encourage and honour those who do and shape, coordinate and inspire their efforts? Here, surely, there is a role for the monarchy. And it is a role which, even as Prince of Wales, Charles has begun to fulfil. More's involved than in 1917. Then, the new honour system only recognised an existing tradition of public service and charitable giving. Now, it's a question of reinventing the wheel. Voluntary action must be revived. Money, lots of it found and public opinion led. I don't want my children and grandchildren, or yours for that matter, um, saying to me, why didn't you do something when it was possible to make a difference uh, and when you knew what was happening? With Charles, we have, for the first time since Prince Albert in the 19th century or the young George III in the 18th century, a royal patron who does aspire to lead the voluntary side of social life, who dares to talk of real intellectual effort and eminence, and, above all, who puts his money where his mouth is. A recent example is the rescue of the Georgian time capsule Dumfries House. A noble Georgian mansion, still furnished with the fixtures and fittings that were designed and made for it by the most eminent cabinet makers of the day. The state-funded heritage bodies were unable to save it. Then, at the 11th hour, and only weeks before a sale that would have broken up the collection forever, Charles cut the Gordian knot. He saved the house and contents by setting up an innovative mechanism to provide finance, a loan of £20 million to be paid off by the development of a model village in the Scottish lowlands. Conservation and high culture will be combined with the economic regeneration of a depressed area. Charles has also brought a similar combination of high ideals and low cunning in the raising of money to the problems of the inner city and its benighted kids. It's a world a million miles from elegant Georgian interiors and even more in need of the prince's innovative approach
A leading member of the prince's household describes this as charitable entrepreneurship. At its heart, there's a group of charities known as the Prince's Charities. The Prince raises their funding, some £110 million each year, and determines their principal area of activity. Most of them are leaders in their field. They venture into areas that others dare not, and they blaze trails that other organisations, in particular state-funded ones, willingly follow. The outstanding example is the Prince's Trust. This helps disadvantaged young people into employment and becoming worthwhile members of society. Most of its clients have done badly at school, are poor or come from broken homes. Above all, they are poor in aspiration. The Prince's Trust uses a variety of methods, from individual mentoring to outdoor adventure activities like these, to give them the confidence to help themselves. Its rate of success is striking, and politicians, New Labour and Newish Tory alike strive to emulate it and to learn from it. If the Prince's Trust can do all this, only imagine what the King's Trust could do. Is this the new role for the monarchy under Charles as it changes direction yet again in its thousand-year-old history? Once the monarchy was the state, then it became the symbol of the state. Now there is a moral vacuum left by the sellout of the state to business values. Will King Charles step into the breach to nurture a new kingdom of the mind, spirit, culture and values? It is a destiny not unworthy of a thousand-year-old throne. Since my eight-year-old self watched the coronation of Elizabeth, the monarchy has managed to survive against the odds by doggedly sticking to tradition and duty. But now, as the state surrenders to big business and the cash nexus rules all, something new is required. Altruism, neighbourliness, the fruits of the spirit are as important as ever. Who will speak up for them if not the crown? Who indeed? catch up with the complete story of English monarchy from Ethelbert to Elizabeth II, go and visit the website channel4.com slash monarchy. Well, next tonight, the turbulent story behind the marriage of Princess Elizabeth and Philip Mountbatten, the Queen's wedding. <laughs>